Our trip to Sri Lanka was a chance to learn about this country and the needs of the 16 million people who live here. Well, as it happens, we've timed our trip to perfection. The Iranian president is in town, so that means security is everywhere. And there's a cyclone on the way. Buckle in, kids. It's going to be a rough ride. OK, we're on the wrong side of the road right now, and there's a bus coming towards us. Right from the outset, we realised this attitude trip would be light. No other. A bus was blown up here in Colombo the day we arrived, so we decided to heed all warnings not to film. Sort of. We decided instead to film from the van, hoping that no one would notice. Security's pretty tight, so we're going to have to resort to cell phone footage because we've been told we can't film in lots of places, so see how we get on. Sri Lanka's had 25 years of civil war, and it's taken a massive toll on this country. On its ability to grow, develop and provide for its people, especially those with disabilities. Elections are due to be held in the east. The military is literally on guard, fearing further attacks. What's on a fish? The needs of disabled Sri Lankans are well down on the priority list. Many families are struggling to make ends meet and just don't have the resources or knowledge to provide for their children with disabilities. Yet there's a growing awareness of the need for support. Here on the outskirts of Colombo, we meet Meryl Fernando, patriarch of the globally successful Dilma Tea Company, and his son, Dilham. Absolutely. Give me a call, we go to a nightclub. <laughs> We've been brought here by John Burton, the man who imports Dilma Tea into New Zealand. How very civilised. Oops, I've spilt it. Burton and Fernando share a passion for helping others. So does Amrit play cricket as well? Raised in humble circumstances, Meryl Fernando is now one of the wealthiest men in Sri Lanka. But he donates millions of dollars every year through his foundation, often to people with disabilities. His foundation is the byproduct of a lengthy battle he waged for the rights of Sri Lankans to regain control of the tea industry. I just could not accept the trade as it was, because we were producing the finest tea and we were selling it as raw material around the world for them to add value and market. So I was within myself fighting the system. When I dreamt that I should have my own brand, I thought I will give our plantation workers a better deal. When you take it, the poles open up and you cool down. Son Dilhan is charged with running the MJF Foundation, an organisation that's assisted 10,000 Sri Lankans and is focused on raising awareness of disability. The Foundation's planned our trip to show others what needs to be done. Sadly, very few business people think of this community service and contribution towards the poor as the responsibility that they have. Behind me is the Dilma Tea headquarters here in Sri Lanka. Every day, executives in those offices overlook the river into the slums of Colombo. In part, this is why the MJF Foundation was started. No one who lives here has a particularly good life. Child abuse is rife. Employment is low. Most of the people that live here come from out of Colombo. They come here for work, but they live in these squalors basically they don't have any toilet facilities so they use the river next door most of the kids that you see running around the place here they're part of an after-school program supported by the mjf foundation many girls here will be victims of sexual abuse the foundations established the after-school program to keep them safe till their mothers get home you can see it's poor but you can't imagine the stench as we make our way through this area my biggest concern is the potential for infection. As my wheels roll over ground with exposed drains and sewage running alongside dirt paths. Just up here is a house that people actually live in. It's too dark for us to film it because it's so tiny, so they're kindly coming out to see me. Hello. This young boy, he's got an intellectual disability. He barely leaves his house. I like your t-shirt. T-shirt's good. You can see the ground here is all wet. The river is just there, literally a couple of metres away. Every afternoon it rains and this place floods.
By the time we reach the other side of the river, the first effects of the cyclone are being felt. The paths through this water, or slum, are awash. Sewage bubbles up through open sewers. 30% of disability here is caused by disease. We meet another child with a disability. She stays here, day in, day out, hidden from view. Sri Lankans believe that having a child with a disability is bad karma, that they've done something wrong. They're ashamed of these kids. The need to keep them home then becomes a financial burden. A lot of the mothers of the children faced poverty. They were having difficulty because they had to stay at home and uh, care for the children. So of course it then became an inconvenience. It compounded their poverty. Whereas this is not a big problem. You just need a little bit of the right facilities. You need the right carers. The same day we visit a school for blind children in Colombo. Our driver has little understanding of disability. He parks our van so it blocks the walkway. When the bell goes, it's mayhem as the kids try to find a new path to class. We've actually just parked the car right in the way of all the blind children trying to get past, so they're a little bit lost because we're in their way. Built in 1912, it's a residential school supported by the Christian Blind Mission and Christian Children's Fund. The government does contribute 30 rupees per day per child for food. In New Zealand dollars, that's around 30 cents for each kid for a day's food. This is home for 220 children. It's one of 27 schools for blind children in Sri Lanka. This is the biggest and most well known. But the principal says they struggle to convince people to send their children here. There's a small village, but I heard 25 blind children are there. But I call them, they don't want to come out. And parents, they don't like to discuss with me. I call them because it's the school, they can come here. They said no, no education for them. We don't like. Still village people are like that. Why? They don't want to show to others because it's shy to show. They think this is not a good thing for their life. The parents are thinking that way. But you don't think that? No, no, I'm not. I'm fighting it. <laughs> Some, some blind children are coming from village places now. Little bit now, they're changing their minds. The children are taken in from two and a half years of age. Many stay until they're 20. Most only ever visit their families once or twice a year. Even then, the school has to actually take the children home to them. So some parents may never see their children again once they come here? No. Normally they don't like to come here. So we are going there and uh, hand over the child to the parents because otherwise they miss the parents for one day. That's why. This is when you start to understand what it is to have a disability in this country. These children are sent away for two reasons. Most schools don't consider their needs and their parents have to work. In this group here, there's a family of three who are partially sighted. Their parents are partially sighted as well, but sadly, their dad died not so long ago. So now, these guys are going to spend their childhood here.